Hi, welcome to session three of our four session power planning series. I am Heather Christie and I'm here with Mark Sanborn. We're going to be talking today about getting clarity on what you want and creating your plan to achieve it. Last session, we discussed the challenges related to resistance, and I hope you took on the exercises we shared at the end of our podcast. If you didn't catch that session or the first, please go back and listen in. You will get the most value from these sessions if you complete those exercises. Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick us off today. Thanks, Heather. It's great to be back with you. I hope everyone's making some progress from the ideas they learned in session one and two, because we've got lots more to share in this in the final session. You know, as we begin on getting clear on what you really want, I'm reminded of something Henry James famously said. He said, it's time to start living the life you've imagined. I've come to believe that the problem isn't that people aren't living the life they've imagined, but that they haven't imagined a life different than they're living. They're stuck in the familiar. They haven't really dreamed or brainstormed or blue skied to get a bigger version of what their life could be. Now, Heather, I know that you've got a process for helping people get clear on what's important to them. So I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about how to do that. Thanks, Mark. I love that quote by Henry James, and you're so right. I I tease my clients sometimes about the fact that I know most people spend more time planning their vacation than they do planning for what they want in their life and their business. So it's really important that we dedicate and devote the proper amount of time to really reflect and get clear on what you want to have in life. The model that we've created, I actually have as a series, and I'm giving it away for free right now at at heatherchristie.com if you want to go deeper into how to do this plan. I call it Reflect, Reset, Go. And the process goes like this. You break your life into a number of different areas. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One area might be health and fitness. Another area is business. Another area of financial, social, family, education. You break your life into all these different areas. And then I take you through a step-by-step process where you look at each area. And the first thing you want to do is you want to rate yourself. Give yourself a score for where am I now? On a scale from one to 10, let's say, if 10 were perfect and ideal, how do I feel about this area of my life right now at this time? Once you've done that assessment, if you've never done this assessment before, it really can be eye-opening. Once you've done this assessment, now you can see where in your life you're really focused and doing well, uh, where you have been setting goals in the past and achieving, and you'll also be able to see where you're maybe not doing so well, where you're not as focused on the things that are important to you. So do the assessment, the reflection. Now it's time to reset. It's really time to figure out, well, what would make my life a perfect 10 in this area of my life? What would I need to do? What would I need to have present? And once you start to get clarity, I think it's just, it's easier to compartmentalize and look at your life in these different areas and really start to get focused and clarity on those individual areas. Once you have that, then you can choose from those different components that you've put together, what's most important for me this year? Obviously, you're not going to take on every single area of your life and try to make every area 10 because you probably won't end up doing anything. I like you to take the top three things. What are the top three most important things for me? And listen, if you get through those top three, you can always go back and add more, but at least you've really defined and prioritized those things that are most important for you. You know, when you take the time and you do that kind of exercise, it's really important then to look at what kind of mindset do I need to have in order to do the things I need to do to get the results I'm after. So Mark, talk to us a little bit about the right mindset. Well, mindset is so important and it's been proven and written about probably most familiarly by Carol Dweck, who wrote a wonderful book called Mindset. And the premise of the book is very simple but powerful, and that is there are really two kinds of mindsets. A fixed mindset says, this is the way I am, this is the way I'll always be. I know what I know, and I probably won't learn or know anything more. Basically, people with a fixed mindset don't see growth as an option. Of course, the reality is is that growth is not only an option, but it's a prerequisite for anyone that wants to continue living a better life, who wants to make more money and achieve more of their goals. And Carol says in her book that the key is, is to deciding that not only can you learn and grow, but that you will, that you'll take responsibility for adding new tools to your toolkit or adding new skills, new knowledge, new behaviors, making new relationships. And I think it's interesting that when 
I read the book, I thought, can there really be that many people that have a fixed mindset who consciously, knowingly believe today's as good as it'll ever be? And I've kind of come to believe, and I don't know that this is merited or borne out in her research, that there are probably far more people who are living as if that were the case than who actually believe that to be the case. In other words, I think if you ask most people, could you be better or do better than you're doing, most people would say yes. However, that doesn't mean that they're actively pursuing growth. That doesn't mean that they're challenging their thinking or expanding their boundaries. And one of the good exercises that I think anyone can participate in is to think about what uh, you use the word reset. I think about a life reset. And that is, if you could just have any life that you wanted, regardless of your commitments, regardless of your current situation, this is just for fun, what would your life look like? And then look at what you come up with and see what elements of that imaginary life could fit into the life that you've already got, that could be attained if you simply committed to making the changes, taking the steps necessary to achieve those things. So I don't think a fixed mindset is something that most people wake up in the morning and uh, commit to. I think it's something that they kind of live by default. So the real challenge is, is to start living a growth mindset by design. I love the concept of the growth mindset. And, you know, I, I think that one of the challenges that we all face as we are learning and growing is that once you read, once you study, once you learn, you might fall in that trap of thinking, okay, I know this. But there's such a huge gap between knowing something and applying something. And so I think just getting that concept in your mind of, am I at a place where I'm ready to adopt this growth mindset has got to be the first step in any sort of growth process. Well, certainly we've referenced the knowing doing gap. You know, most of us know far more than we act on. But I think it's also to remember three other words that will help you in your quest to produce more results. Ability is what you can do. And the reality is, is most of us have the ability to do things far beyond our imagination. Doesn't mean we've developed the skills to do them yet. It just means that we haven't chosen to either develop the skills or to use the skills that we already have. But ability is about what you can do. I think the real stumbling block for people comes at the next two levels. Confidence is the feeling that you can do it successfully. You know, we go back to that idea that most of the time people don't want to start something they don't know they can't win at doing. There's an old adage, and it's, it's almost a, a bromide, you know, that anything worth doing well is worth doing badly at first. Uh, you know, that's how you learn to do anything in life. Nobody starts the new skill as a master of it. You know, learning comes from trying. So I always say, when you think about confidence, don't just think about the confidence that you can do it successfully. Think about what I call the confidence to try and learn. That means you try it, you don't do it perfectly, but you learn something so the next time you try it, you'll do it better. The final stumbling block is the third level, and that is simply making a commitment to do it. I find, you know, that at the end of the sermon at church, I have lots of commitments for the week ahead, and they usually are lost by the time I get to the parking lot because life kind of rushes in and, and pushes out those commitments. So I think we need to make sure that every day we remind ourselves of our basic commitments. I have a list, and they're all in letter form. You know, they're, they're acronyms of seven or eight things that I am committed to every day. And I review the list at least once, sometimes two or three times a day, just to keep those commitments fresh. So I guess what I would say, Heather, is that most people can do far more than they think they can do. They can have the confidence not just to try and be successful or perfect, but they can have the confidence to try, be less than successful, and learn from it, and that... Finally, you've got to have that commitment because uh, the knowing doing gap is bridged by a commitment to take action. You make me think of something that I think John Maxwell said is that success doesn't happen in a day. It happens day by day. And it is. It's the, it's the daily disciplines that you were talking about, those daily commitments. You said something really interesting. Learning comes from trying. I was with a, a gentleman last week who's part of one of my mastermind groups. And I was blown away by the simplicity of what he told me related to his success. He was an extremely successful real estate agent, and he now owns a successful real estate coaching company. His success came from 20,000 cold calls. He went to 20,000 
FISBOs for sale by owners and expired listings to get the listings that he needed to make himself a successful agent. And when you think about that, it makes all the sense in the world. If he did 20,000 of these calls, you think about how good he got at making those calls. He could turn anyone from a no into a yes, not just because he had the commitment, the decision that he made to get this done, but he did it over and over and over. And sure, he failed. He said he failed tremendously in the beginning until he got so good that he could teach anyone how to do it. So it's simple in the thought, but how many people are actually willing to do what needs to be done to build and grow where you need to build and grow? Well, that's the cornerstone of results. And you hit the nail on the head. Most people will hear that story about 20,000 cold calls and be inspired, but they'll stop at being inspired. The people who will become successful and create results will implement the idea. And that goes back to what I said about there's so much that anybody really can do. I mean, you, anybody can make a cold call. Now, what typically happens is you get rejected. Uh, they hang up on you. They tell you to go away. So the goal isn't just to make a lot of cold calls, but every time learn a little bit more so the next cold call you're better and better and better. And you're exactly right. If you're paying attention at the end of 20,000 cold calls, as your client uh, proved, you will have mastered. You'll be in the elite echelons of people who can do that. But the, the ability to do it, to try it, anybody has. The real inspiration to move to implementation, that's what separates the boys from the men and the girls from the women. When it comes to mindset, I think that persistence, which is a state of mind, is one of the single most important things that any one of us can ever develop to overcome the obstacles that we know for certain we're going to face. I'm reminded of a quote by Goethe, the German philosopher, austere perseverance, harsh and continuous, may be employed by the smallest of us and rarely fails of its purpose. For silent power grows irresistibly greater with time. So I do think it's part of it is just get out and get going because once you take action continuously and you're courageous in that action, you know, courage is acting in the face of your fears. When you take that courageous action and you do it again and again, you do build up this momentum, which I think is what Gerda's talking about with this silent power that grows irresistibly greater with time. It is a power that you grow. And part of that power is really going back to what you said, building your self-confidence. Every time you try and fail and try again, and you will ultimately get success, that is one step closer in building your success mindset, your confidence. Now let's take it down to maybe more of a practical level, Mark, and talk about the daily plan review. You know, at a, at a granular level, at a tactical level, this is something that works powerfully for me and my clients, and I know for you and your clients as well. And I really want to talk about four things. The first is, when is the best time to plan your day? I have found through my observation, most people plan their day first thing in the morning, which means they've spent a good chunk of their day planning it instead of creating it. I like to plan my day at the end of the day before, or even ideally the night before. And I'm not talking about some kind of onerous hour-long planning session. I just mean thinking about the day ahead and writing down what it is that is most important for you to achieve. As we talked about in earlier sessions, you know, these aren't just to-dos. To-dos make us feel good, but they aren't necessarily significant results. So think in terms of if there were just one or two or even three results you could achieve the next day, what would they be? Write those down. And if you uh, have the wherewithal, I would actually block time, which we'll talk more about, to uh, aggressively undertake doing them. The second thing is when and how do you review your plan? Well, I I think, again, throughout the day, not at the end of the day, because by the way, if you review your plan only at the end of the day, it's a pass fail grade. You've either got everything done or you haven't. If you go back to your plan at least once or twice during the day, you'll see where you might have had, uh, you know, goal shift, if you will, where you got distracted and taken off course. And then you consciously either can remember to go back a conscious choice to defer something to the following day. When should you adjust? Uh, That's the third thing. Well, I just alluded to that. You adjust when you have to. What do I mean by have to? Hey, if you live in the real world, you have interruptions. Those are minor distractions, but sometimes you have a catastrophe or you have a major distraction. This morning, my youngest woke up with a sore throat and he needs to go to the doctor. Regrettably, my wife, Darla, his mom, is under the weather as well. So she's not in any shape to take him to the doctor. 
I'm going to take him to the doctor today. That's a priority. Family for me trumps business. So I didn't factor that in, obviously, last week when I was planning for today, but I'll make adjustments. Why? Because I need to. And I don't think there needs to be any kind of guilt or pushback. You know, part of me hates cliches and part of me loves cliches because they remind us of the obvious. But like the old saying goes, you know, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And that brings me to my fourth point. What do you do if you're off track? If you're off track and you can fix it, take responsibility. If you're off track because something happened you can't control, accept it and do what needs to be done. I'm a big fan of an old Japanese therapy called Morita therapy. And it basically gets away from how you feel or why something happened. And it focuses on what needs to be done next and doing it. And that keeps us fully in the zone of what we can impact, influence, or control instead of wallowing in self-pity or disgust because things didn't turn out the way we wanted. Thanks for sharing those tips that are, I think, really practical tips for planning. I totally agree with you in when to plan the evening before. I like to do that, especially because we then give our subconscious mind the entire evening to work on how we're going to get done the things that we've committed to doing. So I think it's a really great practice. And one other thing I'd like to add to that is when you make those notes the night before and you've written down those top three or four things that are most important for you to accomplish, again, very distinct and different from that, you know, action on the to-do list that you have that might have a hundred things on it. I like to take those three to four things and force myself to prioritize them. And I know that's not easy. When I, usually when I ask my clients to do this, they want to put a number one and a number one and a number one and a number one. And that's obvious with the challenges there. So really getting clarity on it. If life happens, as Mark was saying, which it will, I like how you call it goal shift. I call it squirrel, right? When you get something comes in and you have to shift and and follow that other path, have you really focused on at least the number one priority? So do everything you can to see if you can get those items that are most important to you, those action items prioritized in that day. One of the other things you were going to talk about too, Mark, was the time blocking, which I think is really one of the most important time management tips that I think you can take from any of the time management programs that are out there. And of course, there is no such thing as time management. We all know that. It's really about managing our own choices. Talk to us a little bit, Mark, about time blocking and what's worked for you and for your clients. I'm going to recommend a resource that I I read and just thought highly of. And it's not a book I've written. I don't write about productivity per se. But there's a new book by Cal Newport called Deep Work. And really the premise of the book, if I may paraphrase, is that kind of the inconsequential and trivial work drives out our ability to create time to focus on what's truly important, difficult. You know, a deep work is work that takes some thought and some study and some reflection. And you can't do it uh, squeezed in between a couple other, you know, phone calls to return or emails to write. I think anyone who makes the time to read that book will have a PhD in time blocking at the end. But basically, time blocking says if you give an appointment to important people, you should give an appointment to important work. In my office, I try to create time in the morning when I'm most creative, and that's research that bears out on most people. Most people are more creative in the morning than they are later in the day, simply because the day fills up with ideas and activities and demands that kind of crowds out space for creative ideas. I try to spend ideally two hours blocking time for the important work I do, client prep, creative planning for presentations, writing, those kinds of things. And then I leave time later in the morning, late morning and afternoon for the logistical things, the phone calls I have to return or initiate, the emails I need to write, the things I need to do. These are where the to-dos pop up. So I can't, because I don't know the nature of everyone's business who is listening, tell them how much time necessarily or when to schedule. But I would suggest that you schedule at least one or two hours a day, time blocks, to address those things that you need to get done, that you wrote down the the night before, the results that need to be created, or the deep thinking, planning, study, and creating that's so important for being successful in any business. 
Great advice, Mark. Thank you for that. I know we have gone over so many things in this podcast. I hope you've taken great notes. You have some quotes to think about, some practical tips on planning, and even a book to read, the deep workbook. I haven't read that yet. I look forward to it. One thing I want you to, to think about right now, if you're feeling overwhelmed at all, there are so many things to do. And you heard my story about the 20,000 cold calls and you know all these different methodologies. I just want you to remember one thing. If you're the type of person like most of my clients, you know, I, we, Mark and I both work with top performers. If you are like them, there's a good chance that if you have 10 things to do in a day and you do nine of them really, really well, but one of them you either don't get done or don't get done right. Instead of focusing on the nine things you did really well, if you find yourself pondering the one thing that you didn't do well, you might fall into that category of perfectionism where you have really high standards for yourself. And if you're that type of person, I just want you to think about this before we end today. I want you to think about this statement and possibly write it down, put it on a post-it note, put it in front of you. It goes like this, improvement over perfection. If you're wondering where to start with all of this, pick one or two things that we talked about today and implement those. Go for improvement. Don't worry about getting it all right. If, if you can't see yourself getting two hours per day of time blocking the way that Mark does, obviously Mark has reached a level of mastery. You don't get to where he is in life without really setting aside that time. But if two hours for you is too much, go for improvement. Go for 20 minutes. Go for 30 minutes. Just do your best. Improvement over perfection. Here are some things to take away in our Get Started Now session, some exercise for you to work on until our next podcast comes out. Number one, make sure your primary goal and plan to accomplish your goal is in writing. I'm not worried right now if you know exactly how to get it done. I just want to make sure that you put it in writing. It makes a difference. It'll get you thinking, get you started. Come up with at least your first action item. What do I have to do to get closer to this goal? The second thing we want you to look at is scheduling time for yourself on your calendar. So whatever that time block is that you can take, a half hour, an hour, two hours, just commit to something and put it on your calendar daily, weekly, monthly. We'll talk more about that in our next session. And then the last thing, be thinking about any obstacles you have to co overcome. You know, persistence is a key mindset to have to get what you want to have in life. Be aware of the obstacles you might face. And when you think of them, you can maybe minimize them and just get committed in advance. Make that decision to overcome those obstacles. You don't want to miss our fourth and final session, the four results principles, where we're going to bring it all together for you and help you implement the principles in your daily routine. Again, you can go to MarkSanborn.com and HeatherChristie.com. Let us know what you think of our Power Planning Podcast series. If you have any questions, leave us a question or a note. And if you love it, please share it. Have a great day.